Almost 50 years ago, uh, the Bank of Sweden inaugurated a prize in the economic sciences to honor the spirit of Alfred Nobel by identifying the top scholars in economics. That prize has uh, rapidly built credibility within the economics profession as uh, the uh, honored scholars, the laureates, are universally recognized as the top economists who are making uh, contributions at the leadership uh, frontier of the profession. So, uh, and it is the prize, the uh, Nobel Prize laureates are recognized as the highest honor in economics and uh, and so, and the profession much appreciates this prize as a way to spread information within the community about the topics and methods that, uh, that leading scholars in the profession are using to shed light on economic issues. For the last 10 years, we have, in the economics department at HKUST, have appreciated the opportunity from the Institute for Advanced Studies to, uh, to lead a uh, discussion of the latest Nobel laureate's work. And, uh, and uh, this year, in 2023, the prize was awarded to Claudia Golden for work on women's labor markets outcomes, primarily in the United States. So today, uh, we have to discuss Professor Golden's contributions to economics. We have Xuan Li, who is an uh, uh, as assistant professor in the economics department, a 2019 graduate of Columbia University, and an expert on labor markets, particularly in China, and human capital development also within the region. And, and uh, she is clearly the best person in the department to discuss uh, Claudia Golden's work, and I'm looking forward to hearing about her uh, description of, uh, of the uh, contributions that led to this prize. Professor Lee. Thanks, Dave, for uh, the introduction and general uh, and kind words. Um, Actually, uh, last spring, I taught uh, undergrad labor economics for the first time, and I actually spent a lot of time discussing uh, different papers on gender uh, wage gaps. I was, uh, at the time, worried that I was boring my students. But it turns out to be the case that if that is indeed true, that it was my delivery that is to be blamed, and not the content itself. So. Um, Today, um, I'm going to briefly uh, introduce uh, to you guys uh, the body of work of Claudia Godin um, on uh, advancing our understanding of women's labor market outcomes. From the committee, these years laureate in the economic sciences, Claudia Godin provided the first comprehensive account of women's earnings and labor market participation through the centuries in the US, of course, her research reveals the causes of changes as well as the main sources of the remaining gender gap. Okay. First, a few things about uh, Claudia. She is currently a professor at Harvard, um, 77 years old, I think, yes. And she was the first tenured uh, woman professor at Harvard Econ in 1990, and the third woman to win the Nobel uh, Economics Prize the first one to win it solo. Uh, the previous two uh, laureates, um, Ostrom and Duflo, are, uh, were uh, co-winners uh, with other uh, collaborators. Okay. So she is a labor economist as well as an econ economic historian. And we can directly see that from her PhD training in the University of Chicago. She was a student of Gary Becker, who was famous for using economic theory tools to analyze uh, sociology uh, questions, and Bob Fogel, who was a famous uh, economic historian studying slavery in the US and was uh, the pioneer 
of introducing quantitative methods in uh, the study of history, right? So you see she basically combines these two, uh, two uh, strands uh, of research methodology and uh, framework, uh, rigorous insights from economic theories, as well as uh, careful, thorough, innovative historical data archivi archiving work to build uh, her work on gender gaps. And she has been working on this uh, for, uh, I think, over 50 years now after her graduation uh, from PhD till today. She's still publishing MBA, MBA working papers, I guess, uh, last month, so. And some more things about uh, Professor Goldin I would like to highlight. She is a self-described detective uh, in nature and also by training. She said, I've been a de detective since I was a little kid. I wanted long ago to be a bacteriologist and to my, do my detective work under a microscope. But it turned out she does her detective work with archival documents with large amounts of data. I think she also mentioned that before a bacteriologist, her dream was to become an archaeologist, also kind of a detective. And one thing I would like to highlight is that um, uh, Professor Goldin's work uh, ranges uh, to a broader scope of research beyond gender topics, including income inequality, technological advance, uh, education, immigration, uh, etc. By using a unifying demand and supply framework, incorporating institutions, uh, norms, things like that, so all in a unifying framework, but uh, to, to, to basically uh, study, uh, to investigate, to try to answer different questions. For example, with her uh, husband, Larry Katz, who is also a labor economist, uh, a labor economist uh, and a, a fellow professor at Harvard Econ, she is a leading figure uh, with him in uh, the study of the evolution of the skill premium over time. And this is the quote from two of her former uh, students at Harvard. These two female uh, labor economists are now working uh, at Princeton. Uh, both are tenure professors. They said, although we believe that the committee rightly honors Godin's work, what has been lost in the celebration, in our view, in their view, is that her works on gender gaps is only a part of a larger agenda of understanding inequalities in the labor market. And they, as two of uh, her students uh, that do not primarily work on gender, also benefited tremendously from uh, 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 Claudia's economic in intuition and her keen sense of open and important research questions. Okay. That's uh, some anecdotes I would like to um, share with you guys. So uh, now I would like to uh, briefly uh, introduce uh, the to be, to not, not to be uh, over ambitious, but to try to uh, give you a, an outline of the uh, humongous body of work of uh, Professor Godin on uh, gender gaps in the labor market. I'll follow the roadmap. First, I'll introduce uh, several key stylized facts uh, established in her work with collaborators, right? These are facts, but to be able to convincingly document these facts takes a million times uh, more work uh, than we can imagine, right? And then I'm gonna move on to uh, explaining uh, the evolution of these uh, gender gaps uh, in employment and earnings uh, documented as the facts or phenomena uh, proposed by uh, Goldin and her collaborators. And then I'm gonna to briefly touch upon the international context to move our eyes a little bit away from the US and to uh, uh, look at a little bit more broader picture. And in the end, I'm gonna give some uh, concluding remarks and introduce uh, some currently um, so-called hot uh, literature studies that are inspired by her work. Okay. So the first fact and uh, I think the, the most important, or at least uh, the part that is acknowledged by the Nobel Prize Committee the most, is her documentation of the U-shape uh, US female labor supply over, 20, uh, over 200 years. Okay. So um, 
The fine is, is uh, basically uh, plotted in this figure. So what we see is that um, all these uh, red line, this pattern uh, in, the in the 19th century is contributed to Goldine. So basically, um, uh, before her, um, people only basically know about uh, things that happen in the 20th century using US census records. But um, Claudia actually extends the series 100 years back to the 1790s by going to uh, local libraries uh, and uh, doing the tedious and dirty archiving work of uh, records and historical data, for example, in Philadelphia and some other uh, countries. And also, there is a huge undercounting issue pre-1940s of labor force participation of women because of the way the questionnaires are designed in the census, right? For example, in one time, one occupation is listed as wife, and uh, many women just list the occupation as wife, and it basically tells you nothing about whether she's working or not. So also, uh, Godin, um, uh, devised careful and thorough methods to adjust for the undercounting issue for us to be able to plot the whole time series in, uh, is, is to make sure that they're measuring the same thing, basically. And what we see from these graphs is that it is clear there is a U-shaped pattern. It decreased throughout the 19th century of uh, women labor force participation followed by the uh, increase in female labor supply in the 20th century. Right? And also, if we focus on the 20th century side, you can see that this increase is mainly driven by the catch up of married women to single women. Right? So in at around 19, uh, 1900, basically, the uh, employment rate of married women was about 6%, I guess. But 80 years later, um, it's now almost uh, 50% in the 1980s. And basically, it's, uh, the, the gap between married and unmarried uh, women has narrowed significantly. And to investigate further what actually happened behind the uh, increase in the labor force participation of married women in the 20th century, Goldin break down the pattern by cohort, meaning uh, married women born in uh, a given period of time, and track their life cycle um, labor force participation patterns. And you see here that each line represents a cohort uh, born within 10 years. And um, how each line uh, like evolves with the x-axis, which is age, basically shows the life cycle uh, employment, uh, labor supply decision of uh, women of different cohorts. Right? Although it's unsurprising that younger cohorts will always have a higher labor force participation than older cohorts at any given age. But the key thing uh, is here, I think. That is, you see uh, these uh, women in the middle cohorts actually drastically increase their uh, labor supply at the extensive margin of working, right, of employment, uh, when they enter the 40s and 50s years of age, right? And this basically happens from the 1950s and onwards, if you read this uh, graph carefully, right? So to summarize, the pattern is that we see um, the 20th century labor, uh, labor force participation rates increase among married women is mainly driven by the re-entry to the labor market after marriage, later in, life, later in life, especially from the 1950s and onward, right? So the pattern is that women quit their job upon marriage, but after they finish uh, fertility, finish uh, giving birth to children, and then uh, 
and, the and uh, caring for them and all that all kind of stuff. When they enter their 40s and 50s, they go back to the labor market. And this is a uh, prominent, uh, this is uh, a salient pattern in uh, the middle of the 20th century. Okay. And now we move on to the third fact, which looks more at the uh, intensive margin that is conditional on you working, then how much did women earn compared to men? Right? These plots the uh, US gender earnings ratio of women relative to men uh, from 1820 to now. Right? So basically, you see um, a higher uh, female to male ratio basically means a, a narrower uh, gender wage gap. Right? So if we first focus on the colored solid uh, dots here, uh, uh, giving us the uh, gender earnings gap in the manufacturing sector, we see that it narrowed dur during the Industrial Revolution in the U.S., which is the oops, sorry, which is the um, early uh, 19th, 19th century. But in the 20th century, although like the, the, the time series plot is a little bit messy, but the general message is that it remained um, relatively flat and constant at 55%. Uh, beyond uh, 1880 and the 1960s, right? For nearly 18 years, you have seen pretty much a stagnation. And if you uh, focus on the overall earnings gap, right, uh, which you can include also the compositional uh, component of uh, manufacturing work versus uh, uh, work in other sectors and industries, then uh, we look at these uh, uh, dashed, dashed gray line here. And the pattern we see is that during the early uh, era of the rise of white collar employment, which is 19, which is sorry, 1890s to the 1930s, there is uh, an increase. There is an increase in uh, there is an increase in the ratio, meaning a decrease in the gender earnings gap, and it remains relatively flat throughout the 1980s. And then you see basically a surge uh, starting from 1980s um, for, say, let's say 20 years. But when we enter the new century up to now, there is some fluctuation. But compared to two decades later, let's say, uh, the, the closing of the gender wage gap uh, is somewhat stagnated nowadays. Right? So these are the general patterns of um, the gender wage gap. Right. So. And also, um, one thing to highlight uh, by uh, Claudia is that the nature of the, of the earnings gap actually changed over time. Right? In the late 19th century, the gender gap is pretty much due to the uh, gender segregation uh, in different industries in the manufacturing sector. Right? Because women are confined to low paying jobs like textiles, uh, tobaccos, um, but actually, there's not much of a discrimination going on in that period because these manufacturing jobs have a, a pretty much like piece rate, right? The productivity was uh, easily measured. And therefore, if they have the same productivity as their fellow um, uh, male co-workers, then they're pretty much paid the same. That's straightforward. But what happens is that um, with the expansion of white color work starting from uh, the uh, 20th century and onwards, there is substantial gender wage gap due to discrimination in the sense that uh, equally productive female and male co-workers are paid a different wage. Right? So why is that the case? It basically, it has something to do with the uh, uh, the transformation of the labor market into a modern labor market based on long-term contracts uh, so that you have uh, job ladders, uh, promotions, salary schemes, loyalty, uh, premium to the firm, and things like that. So if uh, uh, male workers are more attached or are expected to be more attached to uh, the firm or to the labor market, then they can basically earn a premium which has nothing to do with their productivity compared to uh, female, right? So you see, like, um, 
a hundred years before, uh, hundred years ago, uh, it's more about the segregation, but now it's more about not being segregated, but when you mix together, there is still this difference, which leads to the final piece of key facts that uh, uh, we, we would try to like, we would try to highlight here. That is what is going on nowadays, that we don't see a total uh, elimination of the gender gap, right? For example, in the US in 2020, there's still an 18% uh, 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 earnings gap in the medium uh, full-time uh, uh, workers, uh, male and female. However, the historical large differences in human capital accumulation or occupation choices that have been uh, driven the gender pay gap primarily have actually been narrowed or even reversed as I'll briefly discuss later, right? But what, like, why still the gap? Right? Why still the gap? And um, the point uh, Gordian co-authors try to argue is that nowadays the earnings gap within each occupation rather than across occupations is playing an increasingly important role in explaining the remaining or residual gender earnings gap, right? If you take a look at uh, the graph on the right here, so this is plotting the residual gender pay gap within each occupation, right? After controlling for education, um, uh, uh, education, uh, age, and, and other things, right? So each dot represents an occupation. And you see that all these dots actually lie below zero, meaning that within each occupation, almost every occupation, there is still a, a gender wage gap uh, in favor of men. And if you group these occupations into several groups like health, business, technology, uh, uh, science, and others, you see that actually the occupations in the business sector has the largest gender wage gap, while uh, the gap is uh, relatively small, the smallest in technology and science, right? But nonetheless, these are still substantial uh, wage gaps. If you see like uh, uh, the business sector, the red dots here, an, an average of around 25% uh, to 30% something. Okay, we're gonna go back to dig deeper into what type of occupations uh, will lead to a higher gender wage gap and why. Well, that's gonna be uh, the latter half of uh, the discussion here. Okay. Now, um, I'm moving to uh, uh, introducing uh, Godin's uh, explanations or uh, the mechanisms that she pinned down to try to explain the evolution of the gender gaps in employment and earnings over time, as we have just uh, presented, right? We're gonna break down into uh, uh, periods, right? Chronically, um, the um, structural change, the quiet revolution, and contemporary times. Right. One thing I wanna uh, mention before I delve into all those uh, uh, like specific factors or players in a determinant of gender wage gap is that um, it's all under a synthesized unifying framework that uh, uh, Claudia and her co-authors have been using all the time. It's demand control labor market equilibrium is the standard intertemporal uh, uh, model of labor supply just in incorporating, right, incorporating in the decision-making process the role of family, spouses, and children, right? So that women will face more constraints when making labor supply decisions, um, and um, especially in uh, the responsibility to bear and rear children. So when to have your first kid, how many kids should you have, and how should you uh, divide the child care burden? Things like that. And all these choice variables, right, are going to be um, solved, right, automatically in a sense, um, um, which is constrained by changes, evolutions of social norms, education access and institutions, 
technology advance that impacted the productivity of housework and also work outside, the nature of the work environment, work humanity, and uh, women's ability to actually time and control their birth, which has something to do with the contraceptives. Okay. okay. Let's first uh, take a look at the early periods, the early uh, 19th century, where the US uh, uh, got underway the Industrial Revolution and see a huge shift from the agricultural sector to the manufacturing sector. The patterns are that the gender wage gap is significantly narrowed, if you remember, but there is a decline in the female labor force participation. Right? So how, how is that coming about? It's because women's relative productivity to men was much higher in manufacturing than in agriculture, because in agriculture, at that time at least, requires heavy manual labor and placed a man at a significant comparative advantage. Right? And so with the expansion of the manufacturing sector and shift of employment to that sector and narrowing of the productivity gap, and you're gonna see uh, the narrowed gender gap uh, as well. But this is mainly for unmarried women. For married women, nothing happened. Uh, whereas, because the industrialization was coupled or followed by the expansion of cities and the progressive separation of home and work, and the social stigma of working outside of home for married women was quite prevalent then, the combination of these two actually um, will discourage a married woman from the labor market even more. And that's the reason we even see a decline in the uh, employment rate, the, the labor force participation rate of women during that time. Okay. And now we move on to the first phase of uh, white collar expansion in the US, which is 1890s to the 1930s. The patterns are that the earnings gap narrowed substantially while the labor force participation rate of women changed only marginally, right? Not longer like declining drastically, but still not improving, right? What's happening behind is the expansion of the clerical sector, which became predominantly female in this process and the clerical sector actually pays a much higher uh, wage to workers than most of the other sectors, right? And so with the technological innovation, the invention of typewriters, things like that, and the enlargement of firm size, uh, which increased the demand for uh, these uh, clerical office workers uh, for management, uh, there is an increase, right? There's an increase in demand for um, high school graduates, basically. And also on the supply side, there is a high school movement started in the 1910s in the US, and this yields rapid growth in the secondary school attainment. So there is an increase in, in, dem in demand and supply. Uh, and these increase in the secondary school attainment is higher disproportionately higher for women than men, right? Therefore, placing more women, uh, dispro disproportionately more women into the uh, higher earning uh, clerical sector. Right? That's driving the, the narrowing of the gender wage gap at that time. But still, um, the participation rate is not seeing an upward trend, mainly because of the institutionalized of these uh, social stigma for uh, married women to be prohibited from working outside, right? So these are actually uh, legislations explicitly prohibited the hiring or employment of married women introduced in the late uh, 19th century and early 20th century, right? So there's a huge friction uh, for married women in this labor market despite the uh, increase in uh, demand and, presum uh, and presumably also supply. And then the second phase of the white collar expansion from the 1940s to the 60s, we see a secular rise in the labor force participation or employment rates, while kind of a staggered 
stagnated uh, plateau uh, phase of uh, the gender uh, earnings gap. And how is that coming about, right? The, I'm gonna go into details, but um, it's actually basically the time, if you remember, that uh, middle-aged women in their 40s and 50s will re-enter the labor market after they're done with, uh, with uh, um, bearing and caring for children, right? So this has something to do with the abolition of the marriage bars, uh, the uh, fertility uh, issue that the um, younger cohorts in their 20s and 30s, presumably unmarried, are of smaller size, and also uh, the widespread adoption of labor-saving technology innovations in home production so that they released uh, like uh, housewives to some extent from uh, being stuck at home, and also these uh, huge events of the World War II uh, and the mobilization of men to join the army, and therefore um, there is a, there will be a higher uh, demand for uh, female labor at that time, and these turns out to have a lasting impact on middle or high skill uh, uh, women uh, labor force participation. Right, and during this time, we also see uh, increased social accept acceptance of uh, uh, married women uh, working uh, uh, outside of home, and firms. Um, together with this, started to create some uh, part-time working schedules, right? So this has also um, been uh, uh, friendly to, uh, uh, to women, uh, disproportionately, uh, supposedly, right? But as you can see, that because the major inflow of female workers during this time is these middle-aged women, when they were young teenagers and girls, they didn't see themselves working in their 40s and 50s, right? And therefore, they're gonna make their uh, educational human capital investment uh, accordingly, which is low, right? And therefore, uh, they have relatively low um, human capital. And when they are like, um, then when they uh, enter the, the labor market, right, they, if anything, that's going to basically uh, reduce the average human capital uh, level of, of women compared to men, right? So if, if indeed there is an increasing trend in the uh, women to men earnings ratio, but that's going to be dampened by this compositional uh, change. And then we move on to uh, more modern times, the quiet revolution as um, called by uh, Claudia in her uh, book in, 26, uh, in, uh, in 2006. Right? So this is to describe uh, the, the ph phenomenon that from 1970s and onwards, women's education attainment surged in the US, right? which leads to a substantial reduction in the raw gender wage gap starting around 1980. Right. So from these graphs, you see that um, this is showing the college graduation rates um, by age 35 uh, of male and female born in different years. You see that um, starting from the cohort born in early 1960s, the college uh, graduation rate of a uh, female already surpassed that of men. Right? And this is only one part, right, going to college. But what about the more subtle part of uh, the, the field of study you choose or um, the, the, the profession or the major or um, the, 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 the occupation you would like to enter? Basically, you see, also see a similar pattern. Although a female has not overtaken a male in uh, the share of students in the medical, law, dentistry, MBA, those kind of professional programs, but they are getting quite close, right? 2.5, 2.5, which means an equal share of men and women. So this trend is, is clear and drastic. What are the possible explanations of, uh, of that uh, surging in uh, human capital accumulation as well as the narrowing of the gender wage gap, right? One thing that they argue is to changing expectations about the lifelong return to education. 
this is quite straightforward because you see like um, women around you in the 1960s, as we just mentioned, uh, going to work, going back to work, middle-aged women, then if you are a teenage girl at that time, you're going to infer from that and adjust your expectation of the likelihood you're going to, you're, that you're also going to work after marriage, right? So then if that is the case, you're going to work a longer time, and so the return to human capital will, um, will, will yield in a longer period of time. Therefore, that will lead you to invest more in uh, human capital, right? And also at the same time is the skill bias technological change that increases the return to college education starting from around the 1980s, right? It's documented by uh, Goldie and Katz and, 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 and Murphy uh, in, in series of work, right? So one thing is that, um, all right, like the, 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 the skill premium is increasing, but that's equally true for men and women presumably, but the thing is that um, women were more responsive to that. And the reason, there could be many reasons, but um, uh, several reasons they argue is that um, uh, girls have smaller effort cost uh, for um, college preparation because uh, they are less likely to have uh, behavioral or disciplinary issues. They have, on average, higher non-cognitive skills, right? They can sit down and like, work on their uh, SAT, uh, work on uh, their math programs, things like that. But, um, and you can think of uh, boys have uh, better outside options, uh, things like that, right? So uh, you see also, uh, a more uh, responsiveness of women to uh, these uh, uh, increased uh, skill premium, and therefore, they, they are entering uh, the the uh, they they are, they are like um, also uh, increasing their investment in college education more compared to uh, to their male counterparts. And the second thing is the introduction and diffusion of contraceptives in the 1960s and the 1970s for unmarried women in the US. It's not like overnight, right? It takes uh, a, a time of around 10 years um, to roll out gradually uh, for uh, unmarried women to have access to contraceptives because of uh, whatever social stigma that can be involved, but that is the case. And uh, uh, Goodin and Larry Cass, they build a theory model which predicts that um, access to these contraceptive pills should increase uh, the age at first birth, the age and marriage of uh, women, and also that will increase uh, their um, expected future work time and their investment in, uh, in, in, in education to try to, like, uh, uh, increase uh, the return uh, in, in, in their career, right? So uh, th that's straightforward, right? That's straightforward. And also, um, they empirically tested for it using uh, levering on the differential timing of uh, the reform across different states and also uh, uh, women uh, of majority and not, right? So different age groups as well as the time as well as uh, geographically uh, states, a triple difference essentially, to actually empirically test all these uh, predictions causally. Right? That's also uh, part of uh, their groundbreaking work that's uh, hugely cited. Right? Okay. And now let's move on to uh, uh, nowadays, right? nowadays, right? Recall what we mentioned about our, uh, nowadays uh, in, in our facts uh, section is that the gap still remains and also the within occupation uh, gender wage gap plays an increasingly important role. Right? So let's try to like dig deeper and try to ask uh, what hap what's happening, what's the mechanisms behind that. Okay. So first let's take a look at the um, graph here which shows the residual earnings gap of college graduates by cohort 
over their life cycle, right? So these are college-educated um, uh, women versus men tracking their pay differences over the life cycle, right? You see that uh, each cohort, of course, has a higher female male earnings ratio, having a smaller uh, wage gap than the older uh, cohorts, right? Than the older, co younger cohorts at any age. But also, you see this U-shaped pattern showing that the gender wage gap initially gets larger as individuals uh, grow older, which is true for all cohorts. And then when they enter their 40s and 50s, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the gap, the gender wage gap started to narrow down again. Right? So that is uh, the pattern, that is the pattern. And they also did a famous case study on MBAs, right? MBAs, this highly educated uh, business sector uh, elites uh, from UChicago Booth, right? Graduates of UChicago Booth, right? And you can see clearly from this graph that, for example, let's track the mean male uh, annual earnings and mean female annual earnings. Um, of these uh, MBA uh, program graduates since their MBA graduation, you see that at the onset, at the very beginning, there's not much of a big difference, right? But soon they diverge over time, right? Soon they diverge uh, over time, largely, drastically, right? And what is not shown in this, uh, in this uh, figure itself, but what they do in their uh, variance decomposition is that they show that career interruptions and job experience accounts for 30% of the gender wage gap in earnings. And also, working hours difference account for another 30% of the gap, right? So you see, like, um, career interruptions and uh, difference in working hours played a huge role, right? Play a huge role. It plays a huge role for men and women, but Who's more likely to have uh, more career interruptions? Who's more likely to be not able to work long hours uh, every week? Coupled with uh, norm, right? Coupled with uh, social norms uh, uh, the, of uh, uh, stereotypes of gender roles, we could imagine that it's going to basically um, disproportionately impact uh, a female a lot more. So they also show that MBA male labor supply is virtually unaffected by fatherhood, while uh, their female classmates, their labor supply is going to uh, experience a huge drop, both at extensive and intensive margin after a birth of, of a kid, right? So indeed, that's, that's the case, pointing to uh, the career interruptions due to parenthood which uh, women suffer significantly more than men is presumably a huge factor in determining the remaining uh, gender wage gap uh, till now. And they also uh, like basically replicate the analysis using data of uh, JDs, right? lawyers, graduates of uh, U Michigan, and document pretty much similar uh, trends patterns. And then you want to ask, is this, does this have something to do with what kind of occupations they are, right? So what kind of job characteristics will predict a larger gender wage gap? And uh, Godin also investigate, uh, try to like answer that question in her 2014 um, uh, paper. And what she showed is that um, Larger gender wage gaps usually happen in occupations with convex earnings to hours relationship. What we mean by convexity is that um, worker A working two hours in this job earns more than twice of worker B who works one hour in this job, right? So the relationship of hours and earning is actually convex, right? So in these convex occupations, you're, you're more likely to see a, a larger uh, gender wage gap. And 
what are these convex occupations looking like? They're generally with higher time pressure, more contact with uh, other people, emphasizes established in maintaining of interpersonal relationships with each other, like businessmen and lawyers. This is straightforward because you imagine your health insurance agent, right? He or she is going to follow you through all the case, right? It's not the case that um, you can have like another like agent like following um, your, your your profile, following your file uh, like interchangeably. That's not the case, right? And also lawyers, right? To follow the same case, you have, need to have the same team of lawyers sticking around working. Uh, perhaps uh, 20 hours a day uh, at peak, right, to, to, to do this. You're going to have, like, tomorrow, having another lawyer taking over the work, it's not possible, right? So these type of uh, occupations have high convexity. Or low worker substitution, right? That's indicator of low worker substitution. And indeed, the cost of providing flexibility for the employers to workers is higher for these occupations with, uh, uh, with low substitutability, right? Because um, it's, indeed, if you work two hours, then like the, 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 the production is more than twice as higher than working one hour, then from an efficiency point of view, I would like to require uh, workers to commit to long working hours, right? So then to provide uh, like uh, scheduling uh, work schedule flexibility to them will be more costly, right? Will be more costly, right? And indeed, for these jobs, uh, for these jobs, you're going to see a high, uh, higher gender wage gap if men have a high, men have a lower demand for flexibility compared to women, because women in tradition, persistent, uh, perhaps to nowadays that they they should. Uh, take care of the household, household, at least more than men, right? So these difference in the demand for flexibility between uh, gender and also the cost of providing, of supplying flexibility um, for uh, a certain type of occupations together will get us a high gender wage gap in these occupations, right? And interestingly, Golden provide a counterexample of such a job, which is the modern pharmacist. The idea is that compared to, say, um, uh, 50 years ago, uh, where your pharmacist basically needs to uh, build a personal relationship, tracking your, your health records, right? Like, uh, it's, it's, it's more like committed a relationship. Nowadays, the technological changes increases the substitutability among pharmacists, right? With the introduction of electronic records and the growth of pharmacy retails as opposed to independent pharmacies, right? So now these, now today, nowadays, the work is more uh, standardized, right? You can't have another pharmacist uh, when you have another visit. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing bad about that, right? It's nothing that's going to take more time to, for him or her to get to know you, no. Right? Basically, your records are on computer and things like that, right? So with that, right, with that technological change, the, the pharmaceutical occupation has become more and more non-convex, right? And simultaneously, you again see these uh, occupations also experience the most um, drastic narrowing of the gender wage gap over this period in time, over this period in time, right? So this is uh, an interesting case study, right? Interesting case study. Right. Then it can also um, lend us some policy implications both on the demand side and supply side, right? So what's the demand side factor? The demand for flexibility or the differential demand for flexibility between men and women has something to do with norms, with uh, the labor division in the household. And the supply side of, uh, of, of flexibility has something to do with technology, right? Whether nowadays with uh, uh, the, our, our uh, AI, for example, AI development uh, or the uh, instant uh, share of large data, things like that, you can uh, make the more of the 
a larger uh, subsample of jobs flexible, right? A larger subsample of jobs to become non-convex and to be uh, to be more flexible, right? So on these two sides, right, working together, uh, we can basically um, envision reaching to a point with a lower uh, gender wage gap in uh, within the occupation. Okay. So now uh, I have um, basically. Um, finished a very um, full of grain of salt uh, uh, introduction of, of the body of work. Let's uh, move a little bit to uh, the uh, international uh, context and the so-called external validity of uh, borrowing uh, 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 what's happened in the US uh, to uh, other countries, right? Indeed, you see that um, in uh, Olivetti, uh, who is also uh, uh, a co-author of, of, of Claudia uh, and, and, and Larry Katz, I think. In her paper, she identifies a U-shaped female labor force, uh, uh, labor supply function using panel data of 14 industrialized countries from an 1890 to 2005, right? So this co basically corroborates, uh, corroborates the um, let's say the, the, the second half, or let's say the two thirds of the latter half of the U-shape uh, relationship documented by Golden over, uh, over 200 years, right? So that's cl collaboration. The timing is quite consistent with the US within those uh, like uh, 14 industrialized countries. But there are indeed uh, countries, right? Which are much lagged behind. So um, the above discussed transformations in institutions, in technology, in norms, in education, in um, expectation, in uh, all those kind of transformations are far from complete in many developing countries even now, right? So as you can see here, this is a, a cross-sectional analysis of all countries using data in 2018 Replicating what Godin did in an earlier, uh, earlier paper is that to look at all the countries in 2018, try to plot the relationship between their GDP per capita uh, and their labor, uh, female labor force participation, you also see uh, a U shape. So like uh, a rough conclusion you can have from that is that the countries uh, here, right, the dots here, uh, countries presumably are still in uh, their phase of uh, industrialization or uh, the early part of um, uh, their uh, white collar worker expansion, right? The expansion of their service sector, things like that, right? So that's, uh, and therefore, right? Therefore, although um, it's about the US in the past that Goldin's uh, focusing on, but her work, are, her work is important to understanding the sources of contemporary labor market gender gaps in many other countries, right? Still relevant in uh, the uh, understanding of reality and in, uh, in um, advising the policymakers uh, in uh, their uh, choices and discussions, okay? Now, let's give some uh, concluding remarks, right? One interesting thing is that most of Godin's work has been completely positive. She's a pure and true historian, very restrained from uh, making normative policy prescriptions. Right? So that is uh, maybe a good thing, right? A merit to uh, a very rigorous and serious historian in the sense. Yet her work provides many insights regarding what policies may or may not work to reduce the gender gaps in the labor market. In worse circumstances, might they work? And how long it might take to, uh, to, uh, uh, until we see the effect, right? So we can learn uh, from history in this way and still relevant today, right? The major takeaways are sources of gender gap and is evolving as a society transforms from one period of development to another, right? So um, although all these factors 
existed throughout this period of 200 years. But in a given period of time, some factors are more important uh, than others in uh, leading to the changes in the evolution. Right? So it's not static. Right? It's, it's, it's uh, constantly evolving, just as the gap itself is evolving. Right? So it's key to identify the root causes of gender gaps and how they interacted how these uh, potential players, uh, drivers, interacted with each other, okay? And also, one lesson is women's expectation about the future play a key role, right? That's, um, I think that goes without saying. Um, and, it, and it has a lot to do with uh, their, their expectations and the gender norms and, 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 and uh, their perception of uh, these norms or potential uh, biases that exists, discrimination, things like that, okay? And then there are um, three uh, strands of research, I think, are uh, nowadays hot topics that are directly, more or less, to a large extent, directly inspired by uh, uh, Claudia and, and uh, collaborators' work. Right. First is uh, the policy evaluation of, of uh, of, of, of family policies, right? And to, uh, together with the evaluation of the parenthood effect, that is parenthood effect, uh, uh, female uh, uh, working hours, uh, female uh, career uh, trajectory more than men leading to the divergence in their, uh, in their uh, weight uh, later in their careers, right? So you see that we don't have a, like, a clear and uh, a, a unanimous answer to that. For example, these uh, recent works show that in Austria, parental leave and child care basically has no impact on reducing a gender gap in earnings. Right? And the authors argue they need to um, first shift the equilibrium social norms in order to be effective. Well, in Norway, it is shown that paternity leave for fathers to, uh, to, to take a leave uh, after childbirth actually has no impact, but childcare provision reduced the parenthood effect, right? You can also argue that Norway maybe has a more um, liberal uh, gender uh, norms, gender notions compared to Austria, right? That is that is possible, so that maybe Norway is already there, right? It's already in a, a good, uh, 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 like, gender equal uh, social norm, right? That could be one of the one of the explanation. But the, the 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 point I want to make here is that it's very context specific, right? It's very context specific to uh, evaluate policies and to uh, give very care, uh, uh, careful consideration of all the. Um, possible uh, players and, uh, and uh, their circumstances uh, uh, in, in each context. The second strand of literature is um, the occupation development and gender earnings gap, right? As I briefly touched upon, um, if we can move the, uh, the jobs towards being more flexible with teleworking, remote working, or um, sort of uh, um, data sharing or, 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 or working at home, those kind of things, right? So those technological advances uh, will, uh, will lead to creation, transformation, and destruction of some jobs, right? And that, of course, right, changes the, 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 the distribution of the job characteristics uh, in the labor market. And therefore, if the hypothesis, hypothesis is true, will lead to uh, impact on the gender wage gap. And the third strand is the study on uh, social norms, right? Currently, it's more viewed as an equilibrium, right? Rather than some predetermined um, factor, right? That's a, like sort of an improvement in the way we look at it. And also discrimination of different nature, taste discrimination, statistical discrimination, static discrimination, dynamic dis discrimination, uh, uh, and um, and oftentimes, discrimination is a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So these, uh, these issues still exist, still exist uh, in, uh, regarding gender nowadays. Uh, and Claudia's work 
some of her work, but I think quite minimal compared to the, the bulk of other work, actually uh, directly looked at discrimination. Uh, but um, that's not her focus, let's put it that way. But now, nowadays, we, we're now seeing more uh, of these uh, type of work from lab experiments and from uh, field experiments and also from a good um, like field studies and uh, trying to pin down the, uh, uh, those, the, the, the evolution uh, of norms and discrimination, which plays uh, also a very important role in, uh, in the gender earnings gap, in the remaining gender earnings gap, let's say, right, after all the technology or the education levels uh, are converged, right? What's left, right? So these could be one important source of that and to have a better understanding of the formation and the evolution and the impact of those things would be uh, insightful. Okay. So uh, that's pretty much it. Um, thanks. All right, so I hope uh, Professor Lee has time for some questions. If there are any, uh, any from the audience, if, uh, if you have any questions. Um, I, I wanted to actually, I had some, something on my mind. In terms of the convexity of occupations, is there kind of a standard measure functionally of, uh, of the convexity of occupations that, that, that we could identify ex ante to, to, to make a comparison? of them, either as uh, for scholarly purposes or for vocational purposes? I think what uh, there, um, I don't know, like, um, yeah, yeah, I think theoretically you can sort of have that like convexity there and the way they measure it is, let's see. Yeah, it's called, I think, the elasticity, uh, the elasticity of uh, earnings with respect to hours, right? So if you have, um, right, uh, data on, 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 on earnings and a good measure of working hours, then basically you can sort of calculate the, oops, you, yeah, you can calculate the elasticity of income with respect to hours and uh, like, uh, uh, an estimate of one means it's linear, right? So uh, with these uh, uh, occupations with an elasticity of over one, then that would be uh, convex. And so basically you see, indeed, the more convex, more convex occupations who have a larger uh, gender wage gap here. That's uh, from an empirical point of view, I think. I wonder, is there any uh, literature on the gender income, like income gender gap for China or East Asia? I think it's, uh, it's tough. It's tough. Um, because of, mainly because of uh, the, 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 the data issue, um, it's relatively hard to have a good measure of, uh, of income, um, of and also working hours. So these unfortunately has been an area dominated by scholars in Scandinavian countries and in Europe. Um, so um, my uh, perception is that um, if we want to like focus more on uh, the Asian or China context than uh, like clever food experiment, those kind of uh, uh, methodologies, methods would, um, tend to be more, uh, more, um, more insightful or fruitful, uh, trying to pin down like certain mechanisms. Uh, in terms of your data quality, then you can't compete with like Norway, Sweden, Austria, Germany, those kind of countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, then that's true. Uh, that's true. And even like in in South America, South American countries. You have great records in Colombia and Brazil and Argentina. So you even, compete, even cannot compete with uh, a country which is elected Millet as the president. So that's kind of uh, insane. 
but that's uh, that's what it is uh, generally, I think. So one thing that I am concerned about is is uh, that uh, the, is the percentage of female at the higher echelon of a of an organization. In other words, the rank. I mean, what percentage of women are at the highest rank of an organization? That's right. Uh, yeah. That that is not totally not included in Golden studies. It seems, but but that is may be very important, right? So, yeah. so the glass ceiling, you yeah, know, the gas this kind of thing. Ceiling, yeah. uh, that uh, it, it, did she study anything like that, or or uh, I mean, how important is this uh, compared with the wage gap? I mean, it, it seems to be rather important, right? So, so if you have just you know, mo like everybody at the highest rank are male, you know, <laughs> or, or or the the highest you know ten percent salary people. Are mostly, you know, male. Need. Uh, so that that may also be a, a, a problem, right? It's, it's a problem. It, it's a so. Uh, yeah, that's right. I think um, she didn't do much work on that, but um, there is actually indeed a literature uh, on um, on like uh, the the top earning uh, the uh, guys being predominantly male uh, and. Uh, also, indeed, the, the top, the top, the, the wealthiest female are predominantly heiress, heiress compared to sort of uh, making a labor income. That's, uh, um, yeah, and also, uh, so I, I'm not aware of uh, so, sort of an accounting um, exercise trying to pin down sort of, uh, if you live in a hypothetical world where you, for example, have a quota, right? Have a, like equal quota for uh, the higher end, high echelon of, of jobs, then how that would um, reduce uh, the, 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 the general pattern in, in, in the income wage gap. Um, but I think even these, uh, these quota thing, um, or any type of this, this policy intervention is uh, far from being able to achieve the goal um, alone uh, successfully, because now you also see like um, I don't know if you guys are uh, familiar with the, with this paper of uh, of, of uh, Bertrand, which is uh, who is uh, Golden's co-author, looking at the females earning right females earning compared to uh, uh, the uh, the male spouse, and basically you see uh, a discontinuously drop uh, of the probability of earning more than uh, more than your husband, right? So, this shows that the the norm itself, right, the norm itself that men should be the main bread earner even at 51% is uh, is a highly prescribed uh, social norm uh, embraced by many even nowadays. Um, so. Um, yeah, I would imagine, uh, and of course, you need to sort of have uh, some of these uh, quota or some some policy to try to break the current equilibrium to reach to a new one. Uh, but um, yeah, I would say um, nowadays uh, we don't kind of see a clear picture of uh, what type of policies would be the most. Uh, effective and uh, cost-saving uh, way of, of achieving this. We are still in the stage of trying to get a better understanding of what works versus what doesn't work in different uh, contexts. So, so I wonder whether we can sort of employ similar methodology that she mm -hmm. uses uh, to, to explain this kind of uh, uh, disparity in, in a, in a, in a in the in the percentage of, 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 of female uh, female in, in the top, in the top one. earn yeah uh, uh, uh -huh. in the top earning uh, category uh, so maybe you can also decompose it into like you know uh, work hours you know uh, disruption <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, and and all these, these three factors that that that, yeah. that you have been making about. maybe they also contribute to this right so yeah. so I think is it is the main bottleneck the data perhaps. It seems that in this kind of research, oftentimes data is a, is a is a really the bottleneck there, right? 
if you have the data, then you can just carry out similar research, yeah. right? Yeah, I think I think that's true, especially when you would like to get a convincing point estimate. You need to narrow down within a certain group of people uh, where you can actually compare. Um, as, as I mentioned, like many of the top 100, uh, like top percent wealthy uh, uh, women are actually ARS compared to men. So they are like totally sort of uh, different people uh, from a compositional point of view. So yeah, so if you want to like focus on that group, then um, you might need uh, good data on from their birth to their death to the schools they attend. Uh, to the, let's say, the network they have and all those kind of things, which could be available for some Scandinavian countries. Um, yeah, like uh, my point is that uh, I think the requirement for data is uh, is is high. Is high. Um, it's not. It seems like, worth it. Yeah. It seems worth yeah, it. Yeah, right? it seems it, worth it. it. True. People can find out. You know that, that that would be like, you know, opening up. Uh, you know, another area of research, uh, which is kind of like, like an extension of Golden's work, but then quite, you know, also very informative and, and yeah. useful. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I hope, um, that's right. That's right. And, um, you also had something to do with like managerial, uh, like economics and, and like like different personal traits of uh, men and women and all those kind of things um, uh, to which is kind of hard to, to measure or to control for so as to get the residual at the very top the 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 the, the, the characteristic the feature of the job job content might sometimes be uh, hard to, to actually measure hours you work right those kind of things but indeed if we can have a um, we can make some progress in that regard um, using this framework, using the way of thinking uh, and the methodology. Then that would be um, that would be super super insightful. And also, only in that way can we um, sort of get like a back of envelope calculation of uh, say uh, what the counterfactuals can be if we move in certain directions in terms of policy and things like that. That's a, that's a great comment. Yeah. So um, I would like to know how do they measure um, the social norm in their articles? Like, how do they know that they have reached an equilibrium of social norms, or uh, they just like state uh, an interval to be some kind of uh, having a social norm? They, they just cut them into intervals, or they have something, some methods to to measure. Uh, specifically what the social norm is? Um, I think uh, the answer is two parts. So in their model and in um, most theoret theoretical models nowadays, I don't see sort of um, like, a, like, like a deep parameter called like social norms, like, like elasticity, like, like tendency, those kind of things. Um, so basically, it's still like sort of something you can put into it uh, using your way. Uh, there's not a standard way to do it. In terms of measuring, um, you can refer to uh, the work of uh, the work of um, Ernest Fair, uh, Erwin Falk, and uh, their students. Uh, they're running a global uh, preferences survey, basically. Um, design like a lot of like uh, very complicated and uh, standardized uh, questionnaires uh, to uh, elicit uh, the the preferences in all the different dimensions of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of 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 socioeconomic life, including gender attitudes as well. Um, and also, uh, you can have, let's say, I don't know, like the like, yeah. I think I think a good starting point is to take a look at the um, uh, like uh, the, the global preferences survey uh, that uh, by uh, 
uh, Ermin Falk and, and, her, and his collaborators. Um, and the idea is that, um, again, um, I think there is a gap between uh, what's, what's, what we're able to like, put it st uh, structurally to estimate and uh, what we see uh, as a, a cross-country uh, comparison or difference in these measures of norms or preferences. So the best we can, I'm not, be, uh, the, the best one can do, I can, I can think of is basically, perhaps you uh, have a country-specific, say, estimate of uh, your uh, norm parameter that you like embed in your model. And then you then compare with the, the, the survey measures to see if um, sort of there is a good correlation so as to um, uh, give you an insight of whether your, uh, whether your model is working or whether your model is uh, able to basically identify uh, the, the players or, or what are the main drivers of, of the patterns. There is still sort of a gap in terms of empirical measurement, empir empirical measurement and, and the model. Um, but um, yeah, I think, um, but, but the one thing is that you can have a good, better understanding of the, the cross-country differences of, of different attitudes towards equality, towards uh, gender roles, towards um, inclusiveness, all those kind of things. And then you observe uh, like other like different economics or uh, uh, sociological patterns in those countries. Then you like as 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 a, as a thinker, I would say, it would be um, interesting to try to like build the link, right? To build the link in your mind, to have your story in the mind, and put it into model and uh, with. Uh, 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 hopefully good data to, to sort of test that and then bring back to our reduced form survey measures to try to cor corroborate your story if you're doing research. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you mentioned in your uh, in the study that uh, the women and re-entering the job market in their 40s and 50s. Yes. So is it included in Golden studies? So what what kind of uh, job? So uh, do these women really, you know, the, after the, the interruption of their career, say for a decade? Because supposedly, if they re-enter the market, mm -hmm. so the the employer will regard these women as uh, lack of job, uh, the working experience, and also expertise. So, what kind of job? What kind of sector? See, that's that's a good point. Indeed, that that's true. They were stuck in those jobs with, which were relatively repetitive, requires a little. Um, uh, like innovation or, or little abstract thinking, and also have very uh, limited room for uh, job ladder uh, climbing. So they're stuck in those jobs, mainly because they're old. So, and also, um, I think their their outside option, the value of their outside option is also relatively low uh, compared to. Uh, uh, compared to others. So uh, indeed, so I think there is. Indeed, is, is these um, like occupation segregation element to it? They are stuck in this low-paying, uh, hopeless jobs at that time as well. Yeah. Uh, hi, professor. Uh, I'm just wondering about the workplace flexibility and its impact on gender earning gap. Uh, like I have an example, like in COVID nineteen, mm -hmm. uh, female and males both work from home, but at that time, female uh, bear more um, burdens of uh, parenthood, while males can focus more on their job. So I'm wondering whether uh, even we have like uh, something like work from home, uh, females that. Uh, also, uh, more disadvantaged in uh, in their in in, um, in such case, and the earning gap may still remain there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you make a good point. So 
the extent to which um, a tally working or working from home can uh, be uh, compared to um, uh, flexibility, right? Flexibility uh, is, is, is an open question. And uh, let's say um, flexibility is not only in working hours. That, that's that's uh, a, a, another aspect to it. It means a lot of things. It means the hours of work. For example, you can work in early morning and late at night, right? That is also a form of, uh, of flexibility. It doesn't mean that um, it's, it's part-time versus full-time, but just to be uh, at um, higher freedom to allocate uh, your time. I think in that, in that respect, right, um, I would imagine, um, for example, working from home will uh, um, at least boost uh, the, 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 will at least reduce uh, the demand for, 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 for um, flexibility, uh, for, for, for flexibility um, um, by, by mail in the sense that they can now sort of um, embrace some inflexibility. Uh, like, for example, we need to like, um, uh, f finish this task today, then you can basically allocate your time early in the morning, late in the night, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I guess um, that's, uh, that, that, that's a good question. And also, uh, in the end, everything still points to, uh, to, to norms, right? So, um, uh, but all these kind of uh, like changes can contribute to changing the norms, right? That is, uh, that is the point. Uh, we, we point to like equilibrium, equilibrium and evolution of norms. Uh, so um, yeah, so every like little step may be uh, a step uh, towards uh, a good end uh, in this sense. But um, uh, yeah, I'd agree that uh, teleworking might not be sort of uh, a, uh, like a perfect solution uh, to all of this. Oh, okay, so actually, I had had uh, one question on a, on a similar lines in regard to uh, AI and maybe other uh, language mm -hmm. models that, that seem to be uh, increasingly important in the workplace in just the last couple of years. Is there some sort of insight on what kind of uh, impact that these might have on gender wage gaps? Um. I haven't seen um, studies directly addressing that e that issue. Um, my um, understanding is that, um, or my guess is that it, it's 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 nuanced. Um, I think there is a there is a study on on like Uber drivers on Uber drivers. So with these uh, like. Uh, instant big data sharing, right? Like where you can go, you don't need to basically uh, go and try to find customers, right? You basically, you don't need to waste any time like in searching and those kind of things. And um, um, and you, you would imagine that to sort of have a impact on reducing uh, uh, the gap in earnings uh, in the sense that um, women drivers can sort of target uh, um, like target better or or have more flexibility because like if I want to work in a night right I, I have these uh, booking and then I go it doesn't mean that I need to like wander about at a night to try to find customers right in that sense it seems it's, it's like beneficial uh, it's benefiting women uh, but in the end they find sort of a uh, a larger gender gap for um, for uh, like uh, taxi, uh, taxi drivers uh, having a greater access to these uh, like big big data sharing platforms. So, yeah, I think that that might be one example uh, that could be a little bit uh, non-intuitive and not leading to like um, the narrowing of the gap. Okay. 
So thank you to the audience for some, some great questions, but especially thank you to Professor Lee for the, the excellent presentation. So I, I think we should thank, uh, uh, thank her again uh, for that. And, uh, and uh, um, well, we'll see you next year after the next Nobel Prize.